I don't sleep anymore. I don't sleep because I fear what I dream. Perpetual failure, one after another. The antithesis of progress in a systematic decline of everything that I've worked to build. The numbers don't lie, I'm done for. And everyone knew it before I did. By the treaty of Verdun, the subsequent history of the Carolingian world becomes very complicated, but suffice it to say, it's a fast-paced world, growing faster every day, and in my dreams I fall behind like some sickly elder of a nomadic tribe, slowing down the herd until a young warrior smashes my head in with a rock, freeing the others of my burden. How can I keep up? When the demand for content is more than anyone is reasonably capable. When the stress to stay relevant drives the necessity to do more extravagant but less logical things. I recreated Willy Wonka's chocolate factory in real life. And one of these 10 people is going to walk away with this chocolate factory. Do we do it because we want to or because we have to? The line is blurred, and yet it's all coming to an end, internally and out. World famine, food shortages, mutually assured destruction, the absolute enslavement of humanity, body and mind, it's all a lie, backed by scraps of paper with a exponentially declining value. Someone is laughing. They're all laughing. They laugh as we struggle to find our place in the fast approaching new world. They laugh at our naive need to play a role in their liar's theater. But when that play ends, where does that leave us? Useless, ignorant thespians. Lost, broken, aimless, and pathetically helpless from our reliance on the conveniences provided by the prosperous times of yesterday. Who's gonna deliver the food to your door? No one. You will crumble, you will perish, and we will all believe their lie that it is not the fault of our incompetent rulers, our overlords, but that of our fellow man, our starving destitute neighbor, our newfound enemy who suffers alongside us. And we will go along with it all and they will laugh. It's all coming to an end. And there's no clear answer to the final important question. What do we do now? Remember the guillotine, do I come back? A guillotine. I don't understand. The blade of the guillotine must fall somewhere, like a cool breath of air that tickles the hairs on the back of your neck and brings with it the pollen of your newfound purpose. An obelisk for all to observe, from earth to the heavens, to serve as a memento of terrors from the past and terrors that lay ahead. But why me? I'm insignificant. I'm not a carpenter. How am I supposed to build it? What am I supposed to do with it? The knowledge will manifest itself to you only when the time has come and all will be revealed. For this burden is yours and it will be done. What's the price we pay for building a guillotine? Well, with the cost of lumber up 44% in the past two years, and a quickly devaluing soon-to-be worthless paper dollar, how much will materials cost? How do I actually do it? I've got no experience in construction, and certainly I've never built anything like this before. This big. And it has to be big. 12 foot tall sides, and the whole device elevated so everyone can observe its majesty, even from a distance. Maybe a 10 by 10 foot deck, six feet above the ground, which will give it a total height of about 18 feet tall. I'll need to sink nine, eight foot, six by six inch support posts, two and a half feet into the ground. Will that be enough to support its height and weight? I don't know, I think so. Nine, 10 foot, two by six inch cross beams, 11, 10 foot sideboards and joists, 22 by six inch deck boards. There's gonna be three, six by six inch base frames, two 12 foot long, two by four inch upright beams, sandwiched between two by six 12 foot beams, making a slot which will guide the blade. And how the hell am I gonna get these to stand upright? It's already on a deck that's six feet above the ground. I'm gonna have to somehow figure out a method to hoist it all up into position. Support beams on the front and back, supports on the side, cross support beams to stabilize the bascule, headstocks with braces on either side, the top crossbar, and of course, the blade. Roughly 18 by 20 inch piece of metal, cut at an angle and bolted to a heavy mount. I'm thinking I can use something like a street sign as the blade if the metal is strong enough. And it has to be sharp. Not considering all the hardware and tools, my rough estimate for the cost of the lumber alone will be around $1,200. Good lord. 
I sure hope I can get a sponsor for one of these videos, but if not, well, I'm gonna make my rough blueprints available on my website for everyone to see. So if you know anything about construction or can give any advice or critique, please leave a comment because I could use all the experience that I can get. This is gonna be one hell of a challenge, but it has to be done. And I start tomorrow. I have to nail a bunch of stakes into the ground so I can map out the perimeter of the guillotine base. As far back as the 1200s, there have been machines used for the purpose of decapitation. One particular device called the Halifax gibbet worked by dropping a weighted blade down a wooden frame onto the victim's neck. Fast forward to France, 1789, where criminals were decapitated by sword, burned at the stake, their bones shattered with a wooden wheel boiled alive, dismembered, and hanged. These were all very gruesome deaths. And many notable high-status French citizens and aristocrats campaigned for the abolition of capital punishment altogether. One of these notables was a French doctor named Joseph Ignace Guillotine, who proposed that executions be carried out by a simple and painless, humane killing machine. A machine we all now know as the Guillotine. My machine will take off a head in a twinkling, and victim will feel nothing but a refreshing coolness, said Dr. Guillotine regarding the device. It should be noted that Joseph Guillotine did not actually invent the guillotine, but was the notable proponent of its use as a humane alternative. The first use of the guillotine in France was in 1792 on a French highwayman named Nicolas Jacques Pelletier. On the day of his execution, the death machine was placed on top of a scaffold in front of what is now the City Hall of Paris. A large crowd formed around the display. The people loved to come out and see gruesome tortures, the convicted being ripped apart and boiled and burned alive. However, the guillotine was positioned quickly, and within seconds of bringing up Pelletier, he was swiftly and cleanly decapitated, leaving the crowd dissatisfied at its clinical effectiveness. They hungered for suffering. The sand just keeps sliding out from in between the post hole diggers, so I'm gonna have to I think water the, the sand down so it all kind of clumps together. The guillotine would later become infamous during a period of the French Revolution known as the Reign of Terror, in which the First French Republic overthrew the previously ruling monarchy, leading to the 1793 decapitations of King Louis XVI and his queen, Marie Antoinette. The vacuum created by the fall of the monarch brought rise to a period of political revolution characterized by distrust, infighting, and a growing collective fear that enemies and anti-revolutionaries were hiding around every corner. It's about 98 degrees out right now. Sure is fun working in the sun. This fear led to the implementation of the Law of Great Terror, in which political crimes were treated far worse than common crimes, as they threatened the existence of the new free French society at whole. Close enough. Well, I got my nine holes dug. They're all roughly 36 inches deep. Now I'm gonna fill them up with gravel, about half a foot a piece. If someone suspected you of not playing ball with the revolution, you were subject to immediate imprisonment and trial, bypassing the traditional court system. Juries were to come to judgment entirely on the basis of accusation. And there were only two possible outcomes, acquittal or death. This terror would lead to citizens accusing each other of crimes against the revolution, a vague accusation which led to over 300,000 arrests, nearly 16,500 official executions by guillotine, and over 10,000 who died in prison, often without trial. Although the terror is often remembered as a crusade against aristocrats, only about 8% of the victims were nobles. 85% were ordinary citizens who often had the bad misfortune of living in an area of counter-revolution. I think what I'm gonna try to do is try to put in one of these six by six inch by eight foot support beams. Just one to see uh, how difficult it's gonna be. It's been a long day, so I think I'm gonna save building the actual deck for tomorrow. 
After the French Revolution, executions by guillotine resumed until its final public use in 1939. But due to inappropriate behavior by spectators, incorrect assembly of the device, and secret cameras filming and photographing the execution, the French government ordered that all future executions be conducted privately in the prison courtyard. Well, that's one post in, and I'm done for the day. This is gonna be one tall son of a bitch. The guillotine remained the official method of execution in France until the death penalty was abolished in 1981. C'est la vie. Get your life together Get your money right Get your ducks aligned Keep your thinking tight Keep your wits about you Get yourself prepared Take another step Up them killing stairs Get your head chopped off Get your head chopped off This is BBN, the Bible Broadcasting Network, with a global news update. India has just announced a ban on wheat exports. After a scorching heat wave curtailed output, local prices hit an all-time high amid strong export demand. As the world's second biggest wheat producer, global buyers fear that many countries will not be able to meet their food security needs. I the hope you are prepared for what's to come. Following Russia's invasion of Ukraine in late February, India's ban is expected to lift global wheat prices now Perhaps that there are no big check your rations again. Now, more than a half a million people are experiencing famine conditions. We wouldn't want you to starve before the completing data shows your that already The price of pasta has risen by 50% since last year year as supermarket grocery costs have surged. Surely January, nothing bad could come to those who want food. The beginning of the worst humanitarian After crisis all, since World War II. It's just In thinking time ahead. Of crisis, we look to our Bibles for guidance and hope. Spare the weight. Six, verse eight it says, grows more valuable every day. And horse, and you have other forms of sustenance the now. And Hades was following with him. In times the like these, you can never have too much earth, for yourself. To kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by the Isn't wild that beasts right? of the earth. We hope the words Who? of the Lord has brought calm Who to your hearts this? and minds. And now we return to your regularly scheduled program. You can call me Al. Life is easy. Peace.